please. All right, good morning, guys. Great, let's stand up together. Want to start to our new year? And blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, when I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness to lose I feel unqualified for what you're calling me to but Lord with your strength I've got no excuse cause broken people are exactly who you use so give me faith like Daniel in a lion's den give me hope like Moses in the wilderness Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense, so I can face my giants with confidence. You 
took a shepherd boy and made him a king. So I'm going to trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror, but you fight for me. I'll be a champion, claiming your victory. So give me faith like Daniel in a lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see them fall. Going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, Jesus, I'm gonna sing and shout and shake the wall. Won't stop until I see him fall. Gonna stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'll face my giants with confidence. We thank you, Lord, that we can come before you and stand in your presence and sing a song that lifts your name. Blessed be your name. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, your presence in our lives that does give us that confidence to face whatever's in front of us. Just like Daniel was able to face the lion. Because the Lord was with him, you are with us. Thank you for this opportunity of a new year to renew beginnings, to renew faith, to renew our purpose. And knowing that as sons and daughters of God, we do have life with purpose. To know you, Lord, and to be your witnesses in our community and in our world. We lift up our brothers and sisters who are not here today, who may be participating in another way or just not able to come. But all together, may we be lifting up your name and your presence right now. And it's these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And great to see you, Fuka and Fuka. Hey, we're starting to answer the call on the food pantry. Uh, we got it in the bulletin for everybody this week, and uh, so we've, we've had a good start on that. So January is the uh, Super Bowl, we call that, and you'll see it in the bulletin. Please, uh, please continue to bring the cans of soups to our food pantry, and uh, we can get those shelves, shelves stocked up. We have a huge need, and wintertime, the need even drives a little bit more. I hope you can understand that. And everything else that we need to know will be found in the bulletin. Uh, what a great play to start with, blessed be your name. And from David in the Psalms, through Isaiah in his writings as a prophet of the Lord, who worked in the courts of the king of Israel at the time, the king of Judah. How great is our God. They never cease writing about being in awe of him. And so we have, a, we have a song that we usually use, and we put it together as a medley. But how great is our God, how great thou art. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He rides to 
himself in light and in darkness tries to hide and he trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how Oh, God. 
idea for this song that we just finished with comes from Psalm 104. Praise the Lord my soul. Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent. And then we started this morning with blessed be the name and then blessed be your name. So David and the other writers in the Old Testament, they never ceased at the wonders of our God, our Creator. Verse 33 and 34 from that psalm, I will sing to the Lord all my life. We do a lot of that because that's, that's what believers do. They sing to the Lord in these songs. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to Him as I rejoice in the Lord and rejoice so we have the opportunity to do today as we start up the new year so let's move forward in time and we have Paul writing to the Christians in Titus for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ as we start the new year it always gives us an opportunity to kind of renew what we are about as believers and I'm not talking about making New Year's resolutions, which we all, we know how that goes. But just starting with a renewal of our faith. And it's for the grace of God that has appeared, that offers us salvation. So this morning, as we come to his table, it's the first time this year that we have the opportunity to do that, to worship in his presence, thanking him for his sacrifice. That on the night, that he was betrayed. Jesus, at that supper, had taken the bread, and as he broke it, he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, passed it out to the men. He said, take and eat my body broken for you. And that's what we have laying here, bread, representing that. Well, they did, they did just that. And as he had taken the cup and blessed it, and then he offered that to all of them. Peter, take, take a drink. My blood poured out for your sins. When we read that accounting of that in 1 Corinthians, ever wonder what those guys were thinking? Like, what's going on here? This is not something we've done before. Jesus was setting them up and setting us up for later so that we would have the recounting of that in the word. And when we come to his table and we take his bread, we take his cup, each time we do that, we proclaim his death until that glorious time when he returns. So don't let it be the old thing. This is our first opportunity of this year to be at his table and to take his bread and take his cup. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, my soul, how can we even say thank you for this gift that you have given to us that none of us asked for, wanted, even knew was there. 
and yet you offered it to bring us home. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for opening our eyes, allowing us to see what this truly means, that we proclaim your death until the day you come back. May we never take these things for granted. And as we are at your table, Lord, may we say thank you with our lives pledged to you to put away those worldly things and be more self-controlled and godly in your presence that may we may represent the bread and the cup, these gifts given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I was lost, I was in chains. World had a hold on me. My heart was a stone. I was covered in shame when he came for me. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from his arms. i 
die, hallelujah, by and by. Precious Heavenly Father, we come humbly into your presence this morning and ask you to fill this place with your spirit. Father, we just thank you for a new year, a chance to start again. And we pray, Father, that 2021 will come out better than 2020. But, Father, even in the struggles of this last year, we've seen your hand at work in our lives, in our homes, in our community. And we thank you and we praise you for that. Now, Father, I just pray that you'll light a fire inside of each one of us now that will continue to burn brightly in 2021. And that when this year comes to an end, we'll be able to see your hand at work here in Paoli through Paoli Christian Church. And now may all honor, praise, and glory be yours and yours alone, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Hey, ha have you ever thought about some of the things that your parents taught you when you were growing up? Some of them, well, they, they, they weren't really, I, I, you can't categorize them as lies because uh, I, I think it's what re people really believe. Like, like this one. Did, did anybody ever tell you to put hydrogen peroxide on a cut. Anybody here had that happen? Put, put, some, put some hydrogen peroxide on that. You, you know what they found, don't you? That, that hydrogen peroxide actually slows down the healing process. It really doesn't do any good. Or, or another one is, is this. Help me out. Cracking your knuckles will give you what? Arthritis. Yes. Don't crack your knuckles. You'll get arthritis. Uh-uh. They've done tests and they've found out that cracking your knuckles has really nothing to do with getting arthritis. So if you enjoy cracking your knuckles this morning, go ahead because you're not going to get arthritis from it, okay? Uh, or this one. How many of you heard this at one time or another? Don't swallow your gum because it stays in your digestive system for seven years. And anybody hear that one? Yep. Wrong. It passes through just like everything else. So, so if you ever find yourself with your back against the wall and no place to uh, put your gum, be a rebel and swallow it, okay? But, but the point is there are certain things in life that we've been taught, certain things that we've learned that we just accept as true. We just go along with it because that's what we've always been taught. It's, it's reinforced by people around us, and so we go through life pouring peroxide, hydrogen peroxide on cuts and abstaining from the joy of cracking knuckles and swallowing gum. But what if there are more important things in life that, that we've just accepted that have more significant implications? What what if we've gone through life believing some things because we've been told them that if the truth were known, have dire ramifications? You know, one of the things we find as you study the Bible is that three years at the end of Jesus' life, he spent as a rabbi. He spent as a teacher going around from synagogue to synagogue and debunking the myths that people had been taught about God and about religion and about faith. Many times as you read your Bible, you hear Jesus say, you have heard it was written, but I say. But when you were growing up, you learned it was this way, but Jesus said, now I'm going to give you a new way to, to look at it. And, and so when he came on the scene, he, he confronted people's faith and religion and, and their view of God. Things that people had just accepted all their life because that's just the way it was. That's just what my teachers taught me. That's just what my parents said. And many of the religious myths that Jesus spoke about came from 
the way the religious leaders looked at religion because they looked at religion as being an outside thing. And, and so if you're really religious, then you wear a certain type of clothes. And if you're really religious, you follow a certain list of rules and you do a certain list of things and you go through a certain protocol because, well, because that's what religion is. And Jesus came along and said, look, here's what you need to understand. Religion really has more to do with on what's on the inside than what's on the outside. Because Jesus understood that what's on the inside always comes out. And, and so Jesus had a, an inside-out way of following God. And for many, that, that's not how they saw it. They, they saw religion as what you do on the outside. And so they learned to keep up appearances. They, they, they learned that when you're around other Christian people or other religious people, you're supposed to smile. And you don't have any problems, and you don't have any worries, and you don't have any struggles in your life. And Jesus comes along and he says, look, to God, he's not looking at the outside. He's looking at your heart. And that was hard for religious people to comprehend because this was the upside down, inside out way of Jesus. It may be hard for us to believe, but, but there were religious people in Jesus' day who had turned synagogues and the temple, places people went to worship God, in, into places where there were a lot of people who, well, they just didn't feel good enough to be there. Because they made things about the way people dressed and their spiritual death. And, and if you were really a worshiper uh, of God, then you had it all together. And so, so you couldn't have problems. You, you couldn't have struggles. You, you couldn't have failures and hurts in your life and, and really go and feel comfortable in God's house. I, I'm sure glad that was back then. Aren't you? Uh, I mean, I'm glad things aren't that way today, are they? Uh, there wouldn't be anybody who would feel uncomfortable coming here, would there? Because they have struggles in their lives and problems and failures. So Jesus comes along and he changes the way people look at things. And Jesus confronts these commonly held myths of his day. And, and he says, instead of looking like you have it all together, what God really wants, what he really wants is authentic worship. And, and instead of all those religious rituals, what, what God really wants is authentic relationships. He, he wants to know you intimately. And, and instead of acting like you're more religious than other people are. What God really wants is brokenness. Brokenness. That's, that's not a word we like very much, is it? I mean, when you send out a, a resume, you're looking for a new job. Uh, one of the things you don't put on the resume is, I am a broken person. If you work in a business, if, if you're on a board, the last thing you want to hear is things are broken. In fact, we live in a culture today that a lot of people have termed a throwaway culture. More so than almost any people in history, we live in a time where if things wear out or if things break down, you just throw them away. If you don't believe me, have you ever taken a game system or, or, or a television or a computer into the repair shop and, and you leave it there and what do they say? How many times do they come out and they say, 
probably just cheaper to buy a new one. And so we junk it. We throw it away. But, but Jesus looks at things through a different lens. He, he looks at our world in a way that a lot of people don't. And Jesus wants us to look at the world today through his lens. And when Jesus sees brokenness, he sees value and beauty. William McDonald in this book, Lord Break Me, begins this way. Usually when something is broken, the value declines. Makes sense. You, you, you break a bottle or, or a cup or a plate. It's not worth anything anymore. You just throw it away. If, if you get a hole in the carpet, if, uh, if a piece of, of furniture cracks, one of the legs on a chair, it, it doesn't have any value anymore. We throw it away. But he goes on to say, but this isn't the way things are in the spiritual realm. In the world, if something breaks, its value goes down, but God puts a premium on broken things, and especially broken people. Now, now if you want a really good illustration of that this morning, it's found in Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 36 through 50, and and we're not going to read this whole section of scripture this morning because it's, it's so long. But uh, when you go home today, I hope you'll read that. And, and please do because, you know, I like nothing better than for you to check me out. Don't, don't just listen to what I say on Sunday morning. If, if I say it's in the Bible, go home and look it up. But, but let's just deal with this story today. There was a Pharisee named Simon who invited Jesus over for dinner. As a Pharisee, he was a religious leader in the community, and, and I'm sure he heard about this new young rabbi that was teaching some new ways and doing some miracles that people just couldn't understand. And so, so he wanted to check this guy out. And so he invites Jesus, Jesus, could, could you come over for dinner? How, how about Wednesday night? And Jesus shows up at the house and well, Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus for dinner. His, his heart wasn't really in it. When Jesus shows up at his house, Simon literally goes out of his way to let Jesus know that, well, I kind of had to do this, but you're really not welcome here. See, normally when you would invite somebody to your house as a guest, you would, would greet them. And one of the ways you greet people in that day would be to, to kiss them on both cheeks. Uh, they didn't practice social distancing. We, we might say today that, that, that they shook hands, but, but Simon, no, he didn't even bother shaking his hand. And, and when you came to dinner in that day, you would sit down on the floor and eat at a very low table. Now, now people walked dirty streets in that day. That's the way people got around. And, and often they wore sandals or no shoes at all. And so their feet would be very dirty when they get down there on the floor. So, so what you usually did was you provided uh, a bowl of water and a towel for people to wash their feet so they'd be more comfortable at dinner. Simon didn't do that. And, of course, back in that day with all the odors of the animals and sweat from traveling, you, you didn't sometimes smell too good. And so they would provide uh, fragrant and oil to put on your head to, to make you feel a little bit more comfortable. But, but Simon does none of that. He, he, he shows Jesus, he invites him to come over to eat, but he shows him no respect, he shows him no honor. And then in Luke chapter 7, verse 37, a woman shows up on the scene and things really begin to get awkward. Because Luke 7, verse 37 says, she lived a sinful life. Kind of the nice way of saying she was a lady of the evening. 
And when she walks in, people begin to whisper, what's she doing here? She doesn't belong in this place. But it seems to me she's heard about Jesus and what Jesus teaches. And, and she thinks that maybe Jesus could take even her broken life and make it whole again. That, that somehow God could take the pieces of what she's messed up and put them back together and make something beautiful because, because it seems like that's what Jesus says. Now, she wasn't wanted at this party. In fact, she knew that the people in this room, they, they were the last people in town she wanted to be around. She knew what they said about her. They, 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 they felt like she was a throwaway. No good for anything. But, but she knew that's not the way Jesus felt. And so, so, so she comes into the room and she makes her way around the table where everybody's seated till she comes to Jesus and she sits behind him at his dirty feet. And everyone in the room is quiet. Because they're wondering, what's going to happen next? And, and she sees the way everybody in the rural scowl, room scowls at her. Everybody but Jesus. He's probably the only one that looked at her and nodded with recognition. And, and when he did, the dam burst. And she begins to cry, just a few tears at first, and, and, and then more, and... And she leans forward and she kisses his dirty feet. And when she does, she notices something. That, that every place her tears are following, falling, there's, there's a dirty streak. And, and she suddenly realizes that nobody has washed his, his feet. And she knows what she has to do. She, she can't ask Simon. <laughs> She's the last person in the world that Simon would give a towel and a basin to. And so she lets down her hair, which in that culture was an especially intimate gesture that women just didn't do in public. And she begins to wash his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair, and she kisses his feet. And, and, and around her neck, like a, a lot would do in that day, she carried a small bottle of perfume, very expensive perfume, that, that she doled out a drop at a time to, to make herself more enticing to men around her. But when she's at Jesus' feet, she takes the bottle and she pours it all out on the feet of Jesus. It's like she's pouring out her life. She's broken. And to Simon and those gathered there, this seems so, so inappropriate. In fact, Simon begins to think, you know, if, if Jesus were really a religious man, if he were really a prophet, he'd know what kind of lady this lady is. He wouldn't let her touch him. So what Jesus does is he, he turns this story upside down. He, he turns this story inside out, and, and, and he rebukes Simon the Pharisee, the guy in the story who has his act together, you know, the one who's following all the rules, who does everything he's supposed to do. Jesus rebukes him, and he turns and commends the prostitute whose life is a broken mess. He, he, he just turns everything inside out. And he gives her new purpose and new hope. He, in, in verse 48, he says, your sins are forgiven. And in verse 50, he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so, so here's a trick question this morning, okay? Now, now I'm warning you up front. It's a trick question, so you know going in. Who, who would you rather be? Simon the Pharisee? who has his act together and people look up to and he dresses nice and has a nice house and invites Jesus over for dinner? Or this prostitute who's a broken mess but who experiences the love and grace of Jesus in a very deep way? 
Which one do you want to be? Here's why it's a trick question, because, because most of us in the church, if we're honest with ourselves as Christians, would have to say, well, we want to be both. I mean, we want to be respected and have it all together and have people think of us in a certain way, whether it's true or not. So we keep all of our problems behind closed doors. And when we're out in public, we put a smile on our face and and we act like we don't have any problems. We want to be that person, but we also want to experience the love and the grace that only Jesus can bring. But listen to me, it doesn't work that way. If you want to be made whole, you got to be broken. The, the only way to real wholeness is through a door labeled broken. And if you want to experience the love and grace of Jesus deeply, if you want to have that kind of value and purpose in your life, then it comes through brokenness. But, but here's the good news. We're all broken. And those of you here this morning who don't think you are, let me let you in on a a little secret today. You're the most broken of all. It's kind of like the story, the the, the Pharisee Simon who thought that he had it all together was thinking, oh, how embarrassing. This lady's in my house. She's washing Jesus' feet. This can't be happening. When he's the one that should have been embarrassed. I mean, to be a Pharisee of Pharisees, he he had to spend all of his life studying the scripture. I understand some good religious boys in Jesus' day had the first five books of the Old Testament memorized by the time they were 12 years old. And I'm sure Simon had. And I'm sure he'd been through all the Old Testament and he probably had every scripture, every prophecy about the the Messiah right in his mind. And yet Jesus, the Messiah, the person he's been studying about and looking for all of his life, is sitting at his own table with a cheek that wasn't kissed and with feet that weren't washed and with a head that was never anointed with oil. That's how broke he was. He was so broke, he didn't even know he was broke. Because that's the thing about brokenness. The the less you see it in yourself, the more of it you have. And so the point of this sermon isn't that you're broke, because we're all broke. The point of the sermon is to admit your brokenness and stop trying to hide it. Stop trying to pretend that you can put the pieces back together by yourself because you can't. I mean, just look around the room this morning. Just look up here. None of us are unbroken. No matter how impressive we might try to look on the outside. We're the people who can ignore the needs of others just as long as our needs are taken care of. We're the families that yell at each other in the car on the way to church on Sunday morning, but boy, when we get out the door, everybody smiles because we're at church. We're the people who go deep into debt to keep up appearances and keep up with our neighbors and look down at other people who don't have the stuff that we have that we couldn't afford anyway. And we're the people who work 50 plus hours a week trying to prove our worth, and then go home and spend hours on social media trying to convince other people how much better we are than we really are. We're those people. And we are broken. We're all broken. And there's no one here 
this morning more deserving or more worthy of God's love and grace than anyone else. So, so what do we do with our brokenness? What, what, what do you do when you're broken? Well, simple. The same thing your kids do when they break something, right? They're throwing a ball around the living room. They know they're not supposed to be playing ball in the house and it hits a lamp or it hits a vase and it breaks. What do you do? You hide it. Or you glue it back together and you, you, you hope nobody notices it. And for that reason, we are the most in debt, the most medicated, the most addicted people in human history. Because that's what happens when you hide your brokenness. Sooner or later, it comes out. It doesn't work. So here's the really good news. Jesus came to make things whole. But it's only after we're willing to admit we're broken that Jesus can really put the pieces back together and use our lives. You know, this is a terminology that they used to use, they still use with horses. You know, a horse can't really be used until it's broken, right? I mean, until you break a horse, he's not going to pull a cart, he's not going to let you put a saddle on his back and, and ride him. He's got to be broken first. And the only way that God's beauty and power can really be displayed in our lives is through our brokenness. Because that's where God does his best work. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10, that's why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. And insults and hardships and persecutions and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul says there are times in life that things don't turn out the way I wanted them to. Things go wrong. Things get broken. But that's okay because God puts it back together better than I could anyway. And you can keep hiding the pieces and pretending that you're okay. Or you can turn those broken pieces over to God. And he can put them back together in a way that's more beautiful and more understandable and more usable than you could ever imagine. See, that's what God is, is waiting for. For us to just admit that we need him. That we can't do it on our own. And when you try and run, you, you just mess things up. But that's what Jesus does for people. He, he, he knows that we're broken. He knows that we all have cracks. He knows what we're covering up. And, and God says, you know what? He says those very things that overwhelm you, the things that you're afraid somebody's going to find out about, the, the, those problems that are dragging you down, Give them to me. Just, just like this woman, come to me and I can not only forgive, but I can put it back together and make it beautiful again. Well, when you came in this morning, I gave you all one of these. Because as, as I was thinking about this this week, I, I, I came upon an illustration that dealt with glow sticks. You, you probably always already seen them at, at the fair or at some ball game where you go out and they're glowing in the night. And... But you know, the amazing thing about glow sticks is they don't look very glowy until you break them. And all of a sudden, when you break them, what's inside comes outside. And it glows for everybody to see. And I thought to myself, oh, how much of that is like us? It's not until we're broken. It's not until we're willing to admit that we failed and only Jesus can put us back together again 
that the light really shines. And the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works and glorify your God who is in heaven. But the reality is our, our light shines brightest when it's broken. It's like a glow stick. It, 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 it shines, but as long as it remains unbroken, it, there's no glow at all. And as a church, Sometimes I think we shine brightest in our community when we understand that we're all broken. <laughs> We've all got struggles and failures and disappointments. We, we, we are part of a broken church, but that's okay. That's okay. Because let me ask you again, in Luke chapter 7, who do you really want to be in the story? Do you want to be the person who has it all put together, no problems, Everybody looks up to you because they think you've got it all figured out. But, but you know deep inside, you don't. Or do you want to be the person who can admit that I've been broken and in doing so experience the love and grace that only Jesus can bring more deeply? God doesn't work around brokenness. He works through it. But it's only when we bring that brokenness to him. Are, are, are you willing to admit this morning? Unlike Simon the Pharisee, but like the prostitute, that you're broken. That, that you have messed up. That you need help. Because if you are, then Jesus is here today, just like he was there make you whole again and your sins can be forgiven and they can be washed away washed away and you can begin a whole new life with Jesus today but to do it you got to admit you're broken are you willing to do that we're going to be singing an invitation hymn in just a second for those of you out in the parking lot if you have a decision to make, there'll be those out there to talk to you. For those of you at home, call us at 812-723-2664 or get online at paolichristianchurch.org. We, we want to help you too. But for those of you here this morning, maybe you've been faking it a long time. Maybe, maybe you've got everybody else fooled. And they look up to you like people looked up to Simon the Pharisee and said, oh, that's the kind of guy you want to be. But you know you're not. And God knows you're not. If you need to make a change in your life today, we're going to sing this invitation hymn. Won't you come as we do? Let's stand. <coughs> My Jesus Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee of all falling, I'll I resign.
Let's pray. Our Father and our God, thank you that you take the brokenness away. And you can take the scattered pieces of our life and put them back together again. And not only forgive us of our past, but give us a hope of a beautiful future with you. Father, we thank you for doing that for each one of us this morning. But help us also to remember that your death on Calvary's cross was not just for us, but for all those people that we'll come into contact with this week. So, Father, we pray that as we're broken on the inside, that your light will shine out through our lives so that others can see a difference in us and so that they can find hope, too, in your Son, Jesus Christ. Use us for that this week, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Have a- Thank you.